This is the 2024 Canyon Strive On. It's an e-enduro bike with 170 travel at the front and 160 mil of rear wheel travel. And for the first time on a Canyon electric mountain bike, it's now using the Bosch system. So you get that really punchy Bosch drive unit and it's got the system controller and the little neat remote on the bars. I'm really excited about this bike. As soon as I knew Canyon were bringing out an e-enduro bike with the Bosch system, I was really pumped to give it a go. So over the next few days, I'm gonna be riding it around on my local trails and some enduro tracks. And I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about this new e-enduro bike from Canyon. Canyon say that the Strive On has been designed for burly stages of e-bike racing. The Strive On features a full carbon fiber frame. The bike I'm riding is the mid-spec bike and it's priced at 6,900 pounds. That is including a 750 watt hour battery and a great build spec for the money with Fox Performance Elite suspension and a high-end DT Swiss wheel set. The geometry is bang on for a hard hitting enduro e-bike with a slack head angle and a steep seat tube angle for the climbs. Canyon say that the Strive On is a true racing rig that can withstand an entire season's worth of full tilt riding. It's rated to Canyon's Category 4 E rating. It features sealed bearings, thread inserts, and double sealed pivot bearings for maximum durability. At 6 foot 3 or 190 centimeters, the bike in size large felt like a perfect fit for me. I did need to fit some higher rise bars, but that's it. There's a load of stuff to talk about on this bike. But first up, let's take a look at all the technology behind it. So the Bosch motor system is a perfect match for this e-enduro bike. It's nice and punchy, especially under load in the EMTB mode and turbo. You get loads of power, loads of grunt. One of the things I really like about the Bosch is how sensitive the crank input is to the motor output. So you can be put in through a very fine level of leg power or leg torque through the cranks and you can feel that motor adjust instantly to your input. So if you're on like a technical climb where you're just trying to get over a root or a rock or some kind of big object, you can put a very fine level of power in and you get this nice torque curve to help you through it. And then it's got this great overrun feature. So if you give it a nice stamp on the pedals, you get a real kick of power. It's called extended boost. That's Bosch's name for it. So you get a nice kick of power to help you up some technical sections and a little bit like one second-ish of motor overrun. And that can be great on some of these technical climbs. So I love this feature that Bosch have on this motor. And I think right now it's just edging ahead of the competition in terms of the responsiveness and the power that you get with it. This is using the 750 battery as well. We'll take a 625. If you get it with a 625, there's a little spacer that you get with it to accommodate the smaller battery. You can swap and you can buy different batteries and you can put a 750 or a 625 in. This has got a GPS module built into it and a bike lock that's built into the software as well. So my phone acts as my digital key and if somebody stole the bike, I can see the exact location. Now that's really cool because Bike theft sadly is a thing. And I thought that why have we not got better technology to track bikes? Now we have. So all of these bikes come with this Bosch Connect module in and a year subscription to the service. So you can see exactly where your bike is located. So I've got my phone on me. It can be in a backpack or in a pocket. And then after about 10 seconds, I'll get a little audible kind of noise from the bike. There we go. That knows that my key's on me and it's allowing me to actually ride the bike. Without that, the motor will just not activate at all. So I've put my phone just a short distance away. I'll turn it on, steal it. There you go, there's a little alarm going off. That's a little warning. It's flashing. And what? There you go, so there's an audible alarm now which is quite irritating. So I got a notification saying my bike was moved, which is pretty neat through to my phone. So I can see on my phone exactly where the bike is through the GPS module. I think that's neat. When the bike is just in a regular state, it will send an update through to my phone once a day where the bike is. But if someone nicks it, I can track it exactly 
where it is uh, just on the app here. I think it's just really good peace of mind. These are expensive items, many thousands of pounds that have all of that tech built into it and send alerts through to your phone and you'll be able to track it in real time. It's pretty decent, well done Bosch. That's a great piece of integration. So I just wanna show you this uh, skid plate here and how you remove the battery. It's a single Allen key and there's no actual regular old school keys on the bike, which I think is only a good thing. I don't like having regular keys, Allen keys, we all carry these. And there's just one single bolt here. And I'm gonna show you the skid plate because I think it's a pretty cool design, especially for some gnarly kind of climbs when it is easy to scrape the bottom of the bike. So this acts as actually a, a, an easier way of climbing so this is the skid plate itself. So it's like a little toboggan on the bottom of that. It's, uh, I've got loads of scrapes on there already where I've not managed to clean some technical climbs. And you imagine going over a rock or even a route, you can actually use that to slide over. Pretty cool design. If you damage that, Canyon do sell those separately. So you can see this little uh, Bosch Connect module I was talking about earlier. That's it, that contains an eSIM and it also contains the uh, GPS and there's just a single tab to pull the battery out, little strap and then easy to remove and swap out. You can replace this with a 625. I like this just single bolt, single Allen key removal system because some bikes have keys like traditional keys and they're easy to misplace I find anyway. So just having a single key, a single Allen key that you find on a multi-tool a very simple way to remove the battery. I think it's a great design. A whole system for removing the battery and the protecting of the bottom of the bike. Very neat. Be honest with you when i first got the bike and got it in my studio and looked around it i wasn't blown away by the aesthetics of the bike and, and the way it looked i mean it looks nice but i wasn't like wow that looks stunning and i left it a few days before i actually started riding the bike and as soon as i rode it i honestly have fallen in love with how this bike rides and you know sometimes you just gel with something straight away. The very first trail and the very first jump that I did, I was like, this feels amazing. It feels so good to ride. And I couldn't quite work it out because usually I like a 2929 in a long travel. This is not that, it's a mullet. It's got a fairly short rear chain stay, but not super short. And the more I rode it, every trail felt like, you know, you get that high when you're riding and everything comes into place. And it felt like I was in the zone. That is what it felt like on this bike. And I kept saying to Tom, who's on the camera, this is such an amazing bike. And I know sometimes in the videos it can come across like bigging it up a lot, but there is so much that I like about this bike that I'm finding it difficult to find fault with it at all. Now, if I'm being super critical, aesthetically, it's okay, it's kind of fat on the down tube. The battery housing's quite chunky. This holds quite a lot of mud down here and the lines on it are quite nice, but I don't think it's visually the most appealing bike. That's just the aesthetics though, because the way it rides is outstanding. It's just a much burnier tire basically.
performance of this bike is so good, so good. I'm finding that I can get like really squatted over the bike, like super low. And I feel like the bike and the way the suspension moves, the bike is very stable, the suspension's very active. And what that means on trails like this is really rooty and slippy, grimy, it's raining, it's been raining for a lot. The bike feels so composed and the feedback to me as a rider means I can feel the tires digging in, I can feel when they're losing grip, but I can feel when they're digging in, I can push through the bike and the whole platform as a whole, the suspension is so sensitive and the bike provides so much feedback to me as a rider. I have loads of confidence and I know that term is kind of overused a lot in bike speak. I'm continually blown away by how this bike performs. Honestly, in my head when I got it, I thought it's a mullet. My preference is 29-29 usually. And I got it and I didn't have the geometry charts or any details on the bike at all. And I rode it a couple of times before I had any of that information. And I was trying to work out why it felt so good. But I think it's the sum of all the parts. There's not one specific thing that I can call out and say it's that. It's everything. The chainstay isn't too short for a mullet, which makes the bike in size large fairly balanced to me. It's got a 500mm reach and running high rise bars. The setup with the Bosch motor, the centre of gravity is quite low, so I feel like I can really rail corners. It's a really good bike. Really, really good. Often mullet bikes have quite short chainstays and I can feel them a little bit unbalanced on larger sized bikes. But the ratio of front to rear weight balance felt pretty perfect for me on this size large bike. The rear of the bike felt a little easier to tuck into corners and the reduced weight and the lower rotating mass out the rear is most certainly noticeable. The suspension performance always seemed dialed and I rarely found that I had to fiddle with any settings. The bike felt tight and sharp and I never wanted for anything else on the trails. When it comes to gravity riding, the Canyon Strive On is outstanding. I think I get as much enjoyment riding the bikes uphill as I do riding downhill. I find them really challenging, finding little sections that you can try and conquer and try and get up that you would never do, or I certainly couldn't on a regular pedal powered bike. This section here is a steep, technical little downhill section that normally you blast it down as fast as you can. This is the type of bike that I think I might be able to climb up some of these sections. It's riddled with all these roots and logs and I'm thinking that I might be able to get up some of them. Now there's some key factors to making a bike that climbs well. First of all is the saddle angle, the seat angle. You don't want it too far back over the back wheel that it starts to lift the front. This bike has a 78 degree effective seat angle, which is pretty steep. A lot of bikes are 75, 76, 77. This is 78. So what that does is as I'm climbing, my saddle's in this kind of position, it perches my weight further forward. So my weight is more balanced on the bike and the front lifts up less. It is all a balancing act though, because I don't want too much weight over the front. I want the rear tire to be able to grip into the dirt and give me enough grip and momentum to be able to get the bike forward. I need enough punch and instant torque response. So when I put my foot down, I want that motor to engage really quick and give me a nice kind of boost so I can get the bike up and over any obstacles that are on the trail. And finally is the geometry of the bike, the bottom bracket height. I don't want it so low that it's gonna give pedal strikes and I'm gonna come into contact with rocks and things. The suspension, the kinematics, I don't want it bogging down too much. So there's all these things that contribute and can make the bike a very effective climber. This is quite steep, I'm not sure if I'm actually going to make this. Turbo. Ha <laughs> ha! 
I don't think I've ever cleaned that bit. In fact, I don't think I've ever tried. I've looked at it and thought, that's too steep. There's a rut, you can't see it. There's a bit of a dip right in the middle and some roots at the top. But all of that stuff I talked about has contributed to this being a very effective climber, like a very good climber with a skid plate on the bottom as well. There's no big rocks here. It's more chunky tree roots to try and get over. This bike is amazing going up. Really good, 27.5 at the rear. With the DHR2, I felt I got enough bite in it over all of these little sections. This is a really good climber. This drop here is a really good demo of testing bikes and the kinematics and how bottom out resistant the shock is in the frame. So it's a pretty harsh landing. It's not the best. It feels really harsh through the body and everything. And what I'm looking for in the bike is for it to be able to absorb all of that energy into the suspension and not like buck it through to me as a rider and not make me feel like brutally smashed about. So I do this often because it is a really good test and uh, sometimes I can only do it once because if the bottom out on the bike is harsh, it just sends that sledgehammer through the body. Um, and to give you a sense of scale, I'll show you. It's a fairly high, I would say maybe two meters to this kind of harsh, it's really uneven the landing as well. There's, there's no nice gentle downslope, depending on where you land. If you land over here, you kind of push to one side. So it's a good test of uh, bike and suspension. So I just did that drop six times. It's quite harsh landing still on any bike. This is pretty demanding. I used maybe all of the stroke of the shock. So all of that 160 mil of rear travel. Maybe there's like one, a tiny, tiny little bit of that stroke left of the shock and almost all of the fork. Uh, but I didn't feel like I got any harsh bottoms out or didn't feel really jarred and like I didn't want to do it again. And on some bikes I've done this and I thought I don't want to do that again because it's a harsh landing. It's is pretty demanding on a bike and the body actually, because you're landing with a lot of kinetic energy and you're just slamming the bike down on the ground and you're asking a lot of the frame and the suspension to absorb all of that. In fact, the whole kinematic of the bike feels quite tight when you're charging along. It doesn't feel wallowy in the suspension. So you can charge really hard on the bike and the suspension can absorb the massive hits and off the top, it's not super sensitive. I have ridden bikes that feel a little bit more sensitive, but I like how this feels on the trail. It feels like you can really charge hard into corners and you can use the bike to generate speed. And the bottom out resistance and the suspension kinematics are brilliant. I really like how this feels to ride. It feels like a fast bike. And I guess that's what Canyon are trying to make with this bike, a fast charging bike. But it doesn't feel like you need to be a racer to ride it. I think this is suitable for Anyone riding trails or harder trails or enduro tracks, I don't think you need to be a racer to ride this bike at all. It feels like a great bike for regular trail riding, but it is ready to take on some more demanding stuff as well. The Fox suspension on the bike is brilliant. It's basically a Fox factory fork and a Fox factory shock on this mid-level bike, but without the Kashima coating. Personally, I can't notice any difference in Kashima coating other than the way it looks. I think it just visually looks different. The performance, I think, is identical. I mean, I've never been able to tell the difference. So this is brilliant on this mid-spec bike to get this suspension, this performance of suspension, and this kind of kinematic and 160 travel. I think it's superb. I'm really enjoying riding this bike. There's one final remarkable aspect to this bike. Usually, the highest performing bikes come at the highest prices. Important components like suspension, brakes, wheels, and tires can push the pricing up significantly. But this bike, while still a lot of money, seems like a lot of bike for the cash. So when I received the bike, I didn't get the pricing straight away. In fact, I tried to work out what I think it might be. And I thought, honestly, this bike might be around eight, eight and a half thousand pounds. So I asked uh, Canyon UK for the pricing and they sent it through. And I was actually really surprised. This bike here in this exact configuration 
is £6,900, which is it's a lot of money. But I think what you get for that is outstanding value for money. This is a full carbon frame, DT Swiss, like really good DT Swiss hybrid wheels, Fox suspension, and this suspension on this bike is amazing. XT drivetrain, XT brakes, the new Bosch smart system, the system controller, the mini LED. And I think for £6,900, that is incredible value for money. It punches well above its weight. In fact, I think this competes with bikes that are nine, ten thousand pounds in terms of the performance and exceeds them, but blows them out of the water in terms of the pricing. Now, I know Canyon is direct to consumer. The business model is completely different. But as a consumer, what you get is incredible value for money. A lot of money, but you get a huge amount of bang for buck. The entry level one called the underdog is five and a half thousand pounds plus 200 pounds if you want the 750 battery. The stock is with a 625. But that also comes with a Fox 38 rhythm fork, a Float X-Shock, DT Swiss wheels, Shimano Dior 12 speed. For five and a half grand, you get exactly the same frame, the same Bosch Smart system, all of those features, the same geometry. From what I can see in the market right now, five and a half grand for a full carbon bike with this level of performance blows everything else away. So incredible value for money and an incredible performing e-bike. You can buy this, get it out of the box and rip on it straight away. And I would not be surprised if Canyon sell out of this bike immediately because the price to performance ratio is epic.